the evolutionary part is, I think, hard to predict here. And anyway, it's my I'd, bias too. I'd, I'd be curious. It's, it's a multivariate system. Yeah, it's a highly complex multivariate system. Yeah, and uh, but I'm totally with him that uh, mass vaccination in the face of this enormous amount of uh, infectious pressure yeah. is, uh, um, we could say madness. I think it's, it's at the intersection of ignorance and hubris. It was wildly reckless. Um, and I, I think he was, I want to hesitate to say clearly, but it feels like he was quite right about the driving of the proliferation of variants. That... And, and so trying to be an objective, uh, you know, how it is in science. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we try to live in this world of multiple working hypotheses and then design experiments or look for natural experiments to allow us to, to throw out uh, as many hypotheses as we can, leaving us with the one that we can't throw out yep. as the probable, um, right? Um, so uh, this uh, um, driving towards evolution of the escape variant that is the Omicron series, let's say, um, has some anomalous findings associated with it that um, get straight to your core competence. Um, as you probably know, when you build the phylogenetic tree structure for the relatedness of these viruses, using the standard software, and I'm choosing those words carefully, yeah. um, and Let's go back, look back to that in a moment. Using the standard software, it projects that the origin of the Omicron uh, branch from that evolutionary tree that we call SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, precedes uh, the evolutionary branch that gave rise to, for instance, Delta, Delta and the prior yeah. variants. Um, so that's a conundrum. Uh, how can that happen? One hypothesis that I'm aware of is that, and this will get to your, again, to your core competence, I'm playing to your, your expertise, is as you know, um, evolution is not always linear in terms of uh, changes over time. In a given, in a stable ecosystem, in a stable niche, um, you can use uh, um, base alterations as a sort of molecular clock. Mm -hmm. Right. Sort of. I mean, the, all of these molecular clock things have assumptions in them that are Bingo. rule of thumb at best. Bingo. And those, to the best of my knowledge, those core models that are used are built on the thesis that that rate of molecular evolution in a large viral population is relatively consistent. And yet we know um, with our backgrounds in evolutionary biology that in fact, going back to Darwin's finches, yeah. Uh, that what often happens is when a, a organism encounters a new evolutionary niche, yeah. it will undergo an explosive evolution Very rapid. and all yeah. presumptions we have about the rate of evolution go straight out the door. Yep. Um, and, and you have these evolutionary bursts. And that is really one of the big stories of modern evolution, of modern evolutionary biology is the realization that, that you have these interactions between niche availability and evolutionary bursts, and you can't make those assumptions about constant rate of evolution um, and constant rate of molecular change. So um, it is possible that those phylogenetic trees represent a artifact of an underlying assumption in the calculations having to do with the rate of mutation. The, um, uh, the thing that plays to that thesis, the supporting um, data uh, in my mind, is that um, concurrent with the emergence of Omicron it, with its uh, uh, molecular characteristics, and by the way, we don't characterize the glycosylation pattern, we just characterize the protein sequence, so that's a blind spot we have, uh -huh. um, is that um, Omicron also was noted to have shifted its tissue targeting. Now, if you, if you pick at, with Gert and you dive into this, he has uh, a construction around that that shift had to do with these innate antibodies that are non-blocking, driving, um, that evolutionary change, but for whatever reason, 
there was a shift in the tissue trophism from deep lung, which is known in flu and other respiratory viruses to be associated with a more highly pathogenic virus. And you can take an H1N1, this is where, where it was really made clear, was H1N1 has a variant that is very deep lung targeting and it has another variant that is not that is more upper airway and oropharyngeal. And the one that is not upper airway is less pathogenic. Um, and so Omicron, concurrent with its emergence and its incredible infectivity, uh, has this shift um, from its tissue trophism to more of a upper airway oropharyngeal, which is why the paradox of it's more infectious and less pathogenic which on, on face, when you look at that, you go, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. It had this shift. And so that means if we go back to the evolution yep. and bursting, what something happened that caused it to get a new niche. Yes. Uh, I would also point out, this is one of these places where I feel like um, the, the lack of transparency around what was going on in Wuhan that likely produced this is... Uh, is criminal. Okay, because, that's, a, that's a great segue to the third hypothesis. Well, hold on. I just want to put this on the table. The point is, th this virus ain't normal. Absolutely. It behaves so bizarrely. And the ways that it behaves bizarrely are, at least to some degree, pretty easily mapped onto, hey, we were doing some stuff in the lab and we accidentally selected for a bunch of other stuff along the way because, of course, we were. Or we intentionally selected for it. Well, they no, they intentionally selected for certain things. But if they ran serial passage experiments in ferrets and humanized mice in order to make a virus that was uh, more capable infectious of in humans. more infectious in humans... What they did was accidentally trained it for uh, the ability to jump species. The fact that they probably did it in... In, what, in, in saying that, you're giving the benefit of the doubt, just so we're clear on that. Right. They also... Um, if you take... Let's say that they used ferrets, which seems likely given that this virus actually does transmit between individual ferrets and individual minks to other ferrets and minks. Um, if you cage minks together and then you allow them to infect each other the natural rules that a virus would evolve based on don't apply right a ferret in the wild that is infected with the virus the virus has an interest in not wrecking the ferret because the ferret has to be successful enough at doing ferret stuff that it lives to spread the virus and so take for example the loss of sense of smell that seems to come with covid so frequently if you remove the sense of taste and smell from a ferret in the wild, it's going to die. Yeah. It's going to starve very quickly because it depends on those things to find food. If you do it in a cage where it's eating ferret chow, right, then it can be falling all over its neighbors, infecting them. And the point is what that does to the virus is it removes the value of being efficient. Right. If the virus gets spread best when it infects only those tissues involved in transmitting it and it leaves the ferret otherwise intact, if that's a good virus in the wild, in the lab, it's a very different thing. Yeah. And so Fair enough. so my point would be when we're looking at Omicron and Delta and saying it's funny because Omicron isn't the descendant of Delta, we're looking at a virus that is likely that is more likely than most viruses to have leapt species, could have easily leapt into mice because it probably was already trained in mice and so had some experience there and leapt back. That's not something you would expect normally, but we have to leave that possibility open in this case. And then when you talk about uh, it moving tissues within the body, well, we've trained it to have this extremely broad tropism, whereas nature would have narrowed that tropism. And so we shouldn't be too surprised by that either. So my basic feeling is, look, we know a lot about viral evolution. We've got to be really cautious about applying it to this virus because we did funny things to this virus that nobody has explained to us yet. Fair enough. And, and uh, you just touched on the fourth hypothesis. So the, the third hypothesis with Omicron, I think Omicron is a fascinating case study mm -hmm. um, in its emergence in this context. Um, and, you know, it's almost if you believe in divine providence... It, its occurrence last winter was pretty close to divine providence, if that's how you're wired. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but for those of us that have to live in an analytical world of data that we can perceive and analyze, and we're not allowing ourselves to invoke 
the divine as we try to logic our way through these things. I'm trying to. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you're going to offend try, the creator, try, but trying yeah. to square the circle here. <laughs> it's not the creator I'm worried about. Yeah. Um, his <laughs> five followers. <laughs> um, uh, so in any case, um, uh, you mentioned uh, the um, species reservoir and interspecies transfer, which is absolutely one of the hypotheses for emergence of Omicron, um, particularly since it was detected in Africa. The contrapositive for that is that uh, it it was first detected. That doesn't mean it didn't um, appear before then. It was first detected in these four diplomats that had a, a travel history that is not disclosed. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, three of them were European and one of them was Asian. Um, uh, so uh, it, it formally, since we know it infects cats um, and it infects ungulates, ergo white-tailed deer, for example, yep. um, in, in the context of, of Central Africa and Southern Africa, there are plenty of both. Uh, and not to mention the field mice and everything else. Uh, so it had a rich uh, um, uh, palette of, yes. of potential alternative hosts. All right. Well, I want to be careful there because there's, a, there's an important distinction that people typically miss. This virus jumps to a huge range of species. We've seen that. There are only a few that it jumps successfully within, and it has to do both before this becomes relevant to the story. Now, I think we've seen it in deer. I'm not sure we've seen it in... Felids. Bolo uh, we've seen replication between felids. Oh, right. I don't know that. I think, I think it does um, transmit. We've seen this in zoos. I know it transmits to cats. I didn't know that yeah, it transmitted I'm, I'm between. I'm not sure them. about from from felid to felid. Okay, certainly goes uh, in weasels, ferrets, and minks. We've seen it. Um, I believe mice. Yes. So anyway, we've got a group, and that group is already large enough to tell us something. This Especially is a in the strange... context of Africa. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Are there any deer Plenty in of Africa? Yeah, there are, but they're uh, they're bovids, not cervids. But. Well, we got the spring buck and the like. Yeah, okay, okay. So <laughs> they're primarily bovids. But nonetheless, A, we've got a virus that's really good at jumping between species and has successfully jumped uh, once across so, that so, barrier. So the point, not to get too deep in the weeds, the yeah. point is that it is theoretically possible that this thing could have uh, moved from a human host to an animal host, evolved, there could have been an evolutionary burst in the animal host and then reinfected a human host yeah. and been more adapted in terms of its ability to replicate and displace the dominant strains at the time. And it moved through Africa into South Africa and then and throughout the world. Or us, it's possible that the whole African link is only the, an artifact of having particularly astute virologists in South Africa who happen to make be, happen to catch be good at early detection. Yeah. Um, so we can't disambiguate those things. The other one that is the uh, conspiracy spooky version of this, so that third of the four hypotheses um, that I've heard uh, repeatedly from uh, colleagues who have intelligence community ties. Yeah. And, and I think we need to, for the audience, we need to just put a stake in the sand. Um, Yes, I have dealt with many people that are in the intelligence community, including the CIA. I've actually been partnered with one in a prior corporation that we'd set up. Um, I've, I've spoken about this in Bobby's book. And one of the things that I know for a fact, um, I've discussed in detail the training that is performed, is that folks that are trained in the intelligence community are trained liars. That's what they are. They are trained to be very adept liars. So anytime I hear anything from somebody that I know is of the intelligence community as a culture, I know that I really can't place any validity on anything I hear. And anything I hear has to be triangulated. So that's the prelude to saying um, what I hear from multiple people which may well just be an intelligence ploy, is that there were multiple viruses engineered in that Wuhan lab by the woman that is known as the Bat Lady, 
um, who had a prior title, apparently, that specifically acknowledged her leadership as being responsible for bioengineering biologic weapons. Apparently, this was her job title um, in Chinese in some way. Uh, and that there was something in the range of a dozen of these variants that were generated. And the thesis is that the parental Omicron may have been a, may actually have been a predecessor virus, which was part of the developmental program, and that those phylogenetic trees actually are accurate, um, and that it was intentionally or inadvertently uh, released. So that, I think that in the landscape of uh, the world that we now live in, as people committed to um, a multiple working hypothesis approach to trying to discern truth in biology, mm -hmm. which I think you and I share, yep. uh, um, and I'm referring to a, a, a science paper first published in the 1800s uh, that's kind of become fundamental to those of us you were mentioning the other day, um, we need to retrain scientists uh, and, and one of those things we need to do is, is make them read that damn paper. Uh, so multiple working hypotheses. I think we have to acknowledge in that spectrum of alternative hypotheses that Omicron may also be synthetic. Yeah, that's, that is a real possibility. And I would just add, you know, and I'm, I know nothing about whether this might have happened, but the dynamics of Omicron open the possibility that some and by the way, I would think this is incredibly reckless too, but that some white hat entity released- You went there, you used that term. I was wondering, I was, yeah. I was trying not to use that term because it evokes the whole QAnon world. Oh, well, I don't know uh, that it evokes the QAnon yeah. world, but the point is somebody that was sick and tired of seeing the COVID catastrophe unfold could have released as effectively a I contagious think it is, vaccine. I think it's a formal possibility and it was, it was odd. Um, these things that come out of Bill Gates's mouth, uh, sometimes I, you just got to wonder. Um, Why is he so darn predictive when... And, and that uh, after Omicron emerged, um, he gave interviews in which he was advocating for the development. And there was a programmatic initiative launched for development of infectious vaccines. So um, I need to say here that I've done a lot of thinking about infectious vaccines and I can think of few ideas more dangerous um, because oh, what is totally irresponsible, what is inherent to such, a, I mean, you look, you could create Talk about hubris. Well, A, it raises all kinds of questions about informed consent because you're going to pick it's, up. It's like informed consent doesn't matter anymore. Right. But the worst part is at the point that you've created something, even if it behaves like a beautiful vaccine, even if it gives you sterilizing immunity and it's uh, safe, at the point that you have created a vaccine that jumps from individual to individual, what you've done is invited evolution to take that thing and modify it into something else. And, and, and you and I that live in this, uh, you know, with, with a daily awareness of the insane complexity not of biology, just biology at the organism level, but biology at the system level yep. of ecosystems. We're acutely aware that if you release an agent like this, um, that already we know, for example, has um, a ready ability to um, migrate between species. Um, they're, they're, it, that's why I get back to hubris. The, the idea that is being promoted by uh, various players, including apparently the chief science officer of the um, World Economic Forum, that we can apply artificial intelligence and other advanced digital technologies to predicting the behavior of complex biological systems is incredibly naive and arrogant. It's nuts. We are nowhere close. We are nowhere close. And to think that you've got it nailed down invites exactly the kind of disaster that we're facing. And it gets to the culture of um, uh, um, the uh, community that will engage in gain-of-function research. Right. Exactly. 